President Thabo Mbeki uh, delivering uh, a remembrance for struggle stalwart uh, Walter Susulu, the Walter Susulu uh, Memorial Lecture at the Walter Susulu University today, also commemorating the signing of the Freedom Charter on this day in 1955. Talking about education there, talking about Earlier, some serious problems within the ANC, and I don't think his um, disimpassioned uh, tone and, and steady uh, tone uh, gave away how critical uh, the former president, Thabo Mbeki, was of the ANC today. We'll be speaking to some analysts and ask if he, have, if he has spoken uh, this plainly, this, critical, uh, this critically before, uh, using words like organizational death wish. Uh, talking about corruption in the ANC. He asked pertinent questions and he said, is the current National Executive Committee, that is the highest decision-making body of the ANC between conferences, uh, the correct one? Is it up to the task of renewing the ANC? He spoke about decisions in uh, 2017 and this year uh, to renew the organization, but suggested that that was not being done also. I uh, suggested that the economic malaise that South Africa is dealing with uh, is, is not being dealt with uh, correctly, talking about uh, the fact that the social partners within NEDLAC could not come together and uh, decide on an economic program uh, despite the urgency and everything that's been divided, uh, highlighted by COVID-19. All right, uh, let's go back. Uh, Minister Sisulu on the podium and we'll see if Tabambeki takes some questions. <laughs> The person am I audible? The person am I audible? Thank you very much. We suffer from intermittent uh, loss of power in the area that I am right now. And if this occurs during the course of the speech, my sincerest apologies. But um, Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. May he ask a serious gratitude to you for availing yourself to provide the university community and ourselves as a family your perspective and insights. It is perhaps also a historic one that we together celebrate a conscious reflection of the leader, Walter Sisulu. I'm confident that the student community will be seized with analysis of your speech plausibly take up some of the challenges that you've given to them and give themselves the rest of the academic year to rise up to that challenge. To the students of Water Sulu University, whose initiative this was and remains, when the family was first approached to give his name to the university, there was a great deal of controversy around the naming of institutions like this one after people. In particular, the then Minister of Higher Education, Professor Hada Asma, was vehemently opposed to this practice. Asma's attention centered on the notion that it is, in a historical setting, um, there had never been uh, a time when this had proved to be good practice. He, in addition, demonstrated practices of this nature that these were bereft of supporting research that it yielded the aspirational results that initially were intended. There were, of course, several other interpretations and arguments. However, what finally prevailed was that this institution that predominantly caters for the very people that Walter Sisulu represented is what warmed our hearts. A constituency and people defined as excluded, maybe disadvantaged, rural, and the privileged black students. We were convinced then that we would have agreed to his name, being associated in use by these underprivileged students. Because these are the people that would have been closest to his heart. Those who mirror his upbringing, those who would be people that would drive the change, those on whom he had the most ardent passion, these are the people who would put others first. No conditions were laid by the family when we acceded to give the name. And the rest is history. The invitation to respond to uh, President Mbeki and thank him most profusely for his lecture. 
Not to say we have knowledge reality and capacity and challenges as right to be outlined by application to Guy Tobi as chairperson of council in December 29, where he bemoaned the fact that more than 60% of the university lecturers did not have master's degrees. However, we're satisfied that um, we, can move, we can go forward. We are here for you as a family. You are the light and a child with the responsibility of keeping it burning. That is your historical challenge. And together we will change the university. It has probably been said to you before, but this comes from us, his children. I want to recognize my brother, dearest brother Max. I want to recognize the rest of the family that is with him. We're very proud of this man called our father. We're very proud of the generation of Rivonia trialists, a generation that included not only those who went to trial, but those who came before them, Anton Limbede, Reginald uh, Oliver Tambo, Dumanokwe, and many, many more. These are the people who drove the engine of our liberation, a generation that set a family state in the heights far beyond their time, far beyond their own means, but far beyond their own imagination. In short, they were a phenomenal generation, such as I doubt we will ever have again. And as the President Mary has indicated, these were a determined people that would go to the gallows singing. A generation as articulated by the President Bailey that gave us the foundation of our principles, the freedom of chatter. Perhaps a less commonly known fact is that the man after which a university is named played a very critical role, not only not, not, not the most essential role, but for him, he had great joy in signing off as the Secretary General this great document at a place called the Congress of the People. In this sense, what is written in the charter and adopted by the people as a founding, foundational document that would guide us into the future were the words already crafted in the hearts of Walter Sisulu and all his fellow tribalists who lived out in commitment, sacrifice, in a life dedicated to freedom. I don't think that this country pays enough gratitude to these people. I don't think that this country understand what has been given to us. They remain a footnote most of the time, and as history proceeds, they become an even smaller footnote. Without these people, we would not be where we are today. These are people who lived out in commitment and sacrifice in a life dedicated to freedom. It is a rich heritage predicated on a diaphragm of, of critical values and an uncertain commitment left for many generations. Your responsibility is to pass on this on to the next generation. In this context, Walter Sisulu, the Walter Sisulu Lecture is an initiative of the students because you sense the need for knowledge to fill the gap left by how history is being written and articulated. Gaps in history leave dark places of ignorance and disempowerment. They leave whole generations in the dark about where we come from, who held the torch before them, what inspired that, those that have gone before, and what them made, made them strong, and what continues to drive us today as the African National Congress. What is through life is about all this, about standing for a cause, a way of doing politics, about self-giving, sacrifice, about unreserved love for his people, that is a light that shines upon the dark places in our history, our way of doing politics and upon this new generation. That is the light, the life and work that my father continues to shine in your university. That is the light. All right, uh, Lindewe Sisulu, Minister Lindewe Sisulu, uh, talking about her father, talking about a generation of uh, freedom fighters, of leaders uh, that she says are not always honoured enough for what they did to get uh, South Africa to where it is today, and talking about uh, handing over the, the name uh, Walter Sisulu uh, to Walter Sisulu University, about the challenges that university has, uh, but also how it serves people um, in rural 
vulnerable areas, uh, people who need to be uplifted. Uh, she said that would have been close to her father's heart. Earlier, former President Thabo Mbeki remembered the struggle stalwart Walter Susulu. He also commemorated the, uh, the signing of the Freedom Charter on this day in 1955. He delivered the Walter Susulu Memorial Lecture at the university today. And let's speak to a public policy specialist, Kakiso Pue, who's on the line. Uh, Mr. Pue, earlier I was saying, uh, I don't know if, if Thabo Mbeki has been this critical of, of his own party, the ANC, uh, before uh, even using a phrase like, you know, he catches it in a question if the party has an organizational death wish, um, maybe it, it could lose power in future if voters uh, don't want to vote for the ANC. But, it, but he used that phrase, organizational uh, death wish, that's pretty strong. Uh, evening. Yes, it is pretty strong, but uh, I think it's the context of the time. If you remember in the same province, uh, I think earlier two months back, he gave, a, I think he was speaking at an ANC, I think it was a provincial meeting, where he started to maybe espouse what, think, thinking along these lines, where he's actually challenging the ANC. I think previous to this, uh, I think let's be more direct, during the the, pres the term of uh, former President uh, Jacob Zuma, he would speak you know, almost in riddles and rhymes, but very sparingly about criticizing the party. So maybe it's a good development. But for me, I think the bigger question is to say, is he really saying something which is new? In that, look, I, I, I for one, I think what I loved about his speech and what I think we need to always remember, especially for South Africans that might not always, you know, agree with the ANC, that individuals do matter, you know, individual agency matters. And I think that's the story of people like Walter Sisulu. Uh, but the key question, and I think it's the key question he, even he touches on, is, you know, where does this take us post today's lecture? And I think that's the bigger question, which I think we need to be challenging him and even the ANC, because I think it's good to espouse these things. But it, as he even said, the average South African knows what's wrong with South Africa. What they're waiting on is to understand why government doesn't seem to know and be able to actually, you know, actually put a remedy to what, what they know is a problem. Yeah. Do, do you think he's been this critical of uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa before? And like you say, he sometimes speaks in riddles or he asks rhetorical questions. Um, he doesn't directly attack. But, but he was outlining um, the economic goals of, of the renewal plan that Ramaphosa presented after COVID-19. And then sort of pointing to the fact that, that nothing uh, has changed. In fact, the economy has gotten worse and that there's no agreement among the, the partners. Is that that aim directly at the, the current president? I, I, I actually view it as more constructive criticism than anything else. Because I think, look, if you really do read uh, the economic recovery plan, one has got through it, and I can say, look, it, it really doesn't do enough. So I think he, what he's maybe trying to do is to say, look, constructively, as in he can say, listen, he, he's no longer a player. He's not looking for any re-election. So what he's basically saying is, look, uh, it's almost one could say, please don't repeat the same mistakes. Not that we've done for the last 10 years, but I think that we've done for the last 20 years, because he, uh, I'm sure, also includes himself in some of the mistakes that have happened within the the ANC. So I see it more as constructive criticism. Maybe it's almost a What's, I think there's an English saying, which is saying praising with faint, praising with faint uh, condemnation, which is to say, look, he believes Cyril, Cyril, President Sir Ramaphosa is big enough to be able to withstand these criticisms, and he's actually just trying to say, listen, I actually view you as somebody who's worthy enough to to be able to actually take these criticisms on board and not take them personally, vis-a-vis yeah. -vis the previous one who was in your position. He, he did point out the fact, though, that the social partners have not agreed uh, in Nedlank. And then uh, business came up and said, look, we were meant to have these engagements on a plan and, and it's not working out as we thought. But even in Thabo uh, time, was it possible uh, to get agreement uh, if you have around the table Kasatu on the one hand uh, wanting a very strong labor rights, business on the other hand wanting incredible flexibility? Um, is, is that a pipe dream that he was saying, you know, South Africa should, should get uh, to, to deal with COVID-19? I'm actually glad you spotted that because I think that that's something which we really do need a bigger discussion on. This belief that, listen, you can come around the table and everybody's going to get what they want, or at worst, you know, I think the old adage which says, look, if you've compromised and everybody's upset, it means you're going somewhere. I think it needs to come to an end. The key thing here is, listen, government needs to lead, and leading doesn't mean that it needs to do everything, but it needs to give business a, a directive, which is to say, listen, if you are really 
wanting to say, listen, you are part and parcel of South Africa and you want to invest in South Africa. These are the policies that we are adopting and this is where we're going. And that we're not going to do somersaults as has always been the case for, with the ANC for the last, I'd say probably 10 and a half years more than anything else. And when it comes to, to, to unions, I think government does need to take maybe a stronger stance, which is to say, listen, and, and I want to challenge maybe all the viewers, go look at any country that has developed using the model South Africa does with labor. Labor was good for the time of, how do I put it, leading up to pre-1994 and also during the 1994 time. But what we're seeing now is that, look, the economy is changing. Labor even in itself admits that it's, it's losing members. So what we cannot have here is to, to really equate two apples that are not, uh, two vegetables or two fruits that are not the same. Labor is not the same as, as business. Labor gives you a, a value in that it, it needs to protect workers and we always need to be strong on that. But labor does not create the value in the economy. And I think we need to really go back to drawing board and actually ask who is creating value in the economy and how, we, how can we actually maximize that going forward? And this might mean we're going to have to upset labor. And I know it's not a popular yeah. thing to say, but look, as I said, I challenge our viewers to actually go look and just read the precedent internationally, especially from Asian post-colonial states like ours, where labor is, look, you accommodate labor, but labor cannot be the one driving an economic agenda because yeah. labor by its very nature doesn't give you value, doesn't create economic value. That comes from business. And when I say business, I don't, I'm not speaking about your JEC listed companies yet. I'm speaking about SMMEs. And I think that's where the future needs to be going. And government really needs to get on board with that. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, I mean, was, was Tabo Mbeki being a little unfair? Labor, um, I'm sure, was against his uh, plans to privatize parts of, of SA. A, uh, some of his practical uh, ideas at the time. Uh, that might be the case, but was he wrong? And I think that's, that's you know, I think in these discussions, which the, the beauty yeah. of history is that you can always go back and check was he wrong? And a lot, I think the president made a lot of mistakes. I, I'm quite critical of some of his economic stances he took because I think he didn't go far well, enough. What I think I'm we really to, should have Mr. Poor, really is, is, is that he's now suggesting that everybody should be on board with decisions, but that has not been the case. It's, it's more been the case, like you say, where, where government sometimes has had to make decisions because there can be no agreements amongst very diverse partners. You're right. It cannot be the same as that. He might be making a criticism, but I think, as I said, it's his ideal. But as I said, reality says otherwise. And maybe what we should be, as I said, what we should be criticizing, because as much as I like these lectures, we also have to say, listen, we also have a have a stake in this. And sometimes government is not always right or, or the ANC is not always right. And we should be able to say, look, Mr. Former Mr. President, it's great if everybody were to agree, but we disagree with you on this point and that, look, mm -hmm. not everybody's going to be happy. And it's about making the best decision for the country, not so, so much for the, all the stakeholders. Involved. All right, thank you for your analysis tonight. Public policy specialist Kahiso Pue.